uh, give you the floor. So uh, uh, thank you uh, all for coming. And uh, for those of you who are joining with us uh, through Zoom, also thank you for your patience. Um, uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Jose Ramasco. He had earned his PhD from uh, Catambra University in Spain. He was then a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Porto and then at Emory University in Atlanta. Then he's a, he was a re uh, researcher at the ISI Foundation in Turin, in Italy. Uh, currently, he's a staff researcher at the Spanish National Research Council, Council CSIS, uh, which is associated with IFISC. He's the coordinator of PTI Mobility 2030 of the CSIC, the author of uh, more than 95 articles and a speaker of 65 conferences. His uh, areas, areas of expertise are complex networks, mobility, transport uh, systems, uh, and cities. So uh, with, with no further uh, delay, I'll leave the floor for you, Jose, and um, then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Okay, Thank Th thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. I'm very sorry, I'm, I apologize for the for the delay. I mean, it was a mistake with the with the time zones. So, uh, well, I mean, what I wanted to, to talk here was uh, a series of work that, uh, that we have been developing in the last uh, probably five to ten years <laughs> about uh, the mobility and mobility in cities. No? Uh, but before that, uh, I wanted to do a, an, a short intro uh, on, on mobility, uh, particularities of, of the mobility, and then we will jump directly into, into cities. No? Um, the, the intro is very, very, I mean, this is quite smooth. No? So <laughs> the, the technical part comes later. Right? So <laughs> there is a, the introduction is, uh, is just like uh, the one that I have for a, for a guess. So, uh, oops, uh, let me see if it works. Yes. So the, the structure of the, of the talk is something like this. So essentially we have some motivation uh, where mobility started, how it is, how it was, let's say, developing in, in time, and then some short biograph biography with uh, uh, some information on the papers that, that uh, I will describe. And then we will look at the, the city mobility and activity centers, what this means and, and how they scale with the size of the, of the population of the cities. Uh, and then I, I will more or less fulfill the, the promise of, of linking the mobility with other aspects of the, of, of the city's uh, environment. No? So essentially uh, parameters about pollution, parameters about uh, the quality of life, parameters about uh, the, the the transportation in development in the cities. And then um, I will just uh, more or less conclude with, uh, with another final word that we did uh, uh, the last year about uh, what happens with COVID. No? So how, um, uh, while uh, health in cities in the previous uh, line is, is referring to uh, chronic diseases or, or questions like, uh, I don't know, diabetes or this kind of long-term diseases, uh, what happens when you consider infectious diseases? No? Um, and COVID is a paradigmatic example because, of course, there are even you know, some data for, for tracking that. No? Okay, so this is the, the structure of, of the talk. The starting point is, uh, as I was telling you, is very, uh, very smooth because actually it was prepared for a, a class on, on mobility. Uh, <laughs> so the, the first thing is uh, to think about what mobility means or what it is. Uh, and uh, well, in this case, is, uh, it refers to uh, mobility of persons in a way that uh, will not be just walking. I mean, walking, if you look at the, at the say, at the history of, of mobility, of course, walking was the very first uh, case. So essentially people, I mean, the, the humans uh, get out of Africa, uh, it depends on the, on the species, but there are several uh, waves out of Africa, no? at least this is the most accepted theory. Um, and in the, most of those were walking. I mean, there is no, <laughs> there is no, no way to say that there was any other way no, at that time. The first, um, the first records of something that happens not walking was uh, uh, the arrival of, of the humans at Australia. Uh, okay, because there are uh, the, the arrival to some areas of, of the area of Indonesia or the Pacific Islands uh, were earlier. Actually, in Java there are. There are remains for many, many hundreds of years or thousands of years. Um, but uh, uh, the level of the sea of, of those islands had been rising and falling depending on the, on the glacier ages. And in some moments, those islands were accessible uh, on the ground. No? 
So, but for instance, Australia was not that case. Australia was uh, an area that has not been connected to the to the Asian con continent, and so the the population of uh, of humans uh, in, in the Australian continent uh, has happened uh, by someone arriving on the boat. Okay, so uh, probably the boats are one of the oldest uh, transport media uh, that has not been working, and uh, this happened. Uh, in this kind of, you see the, how they look like, it's just a, a few uh, a logs of, uh, of wood just uh, to join together, or uh, there are some other examples like these ones where they may have carved the, the boat out of a single, uh, single track. No? Um, with those, uh, the, these people were able to arrive in Australia at, uh, I think it was around 40,000 years uh, before our, our current era. No? So, um, this gives an idea of the kind of, uh, of technologies and development that there was at the time. So most of them were hunter-gatherers and were just searching for uh, new, new, new grounds to get well, food or, or the space. No? So this is the very early stages of, of mobility. Then uh, still with boats, uh, things were developing uh, in time. And uh, you can reach to, to uh, examples like this one that we have in the uh, this is the Contiki uh, boat. Uh, is the one that was used in the thousand something to essentially colonize all the Pacific Islands. Okay, so this means like uh, areas like uh, Hawaii that are thousands of kilometers of any uh, other inhabited uh, island. So and this kind of boats where you have already a sail are able to do this uh, this long sailing. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a little for the beginning of the history. Then. Of course, we have uh, another uh, stage of the development in the question of, of uh, moving uh, in, uh, in a kind of transportation system. So this, this uh, next stage happened actually in the, in the area where you are now. So essentially in the Middle East, uh, there was a development of the, of the agricultural societies, of course. And uh, this may have started something like 10,000 years before the present era. In 7,000 already, there were several cities already flourishing, including some of Lebanon and, uh, and Palestine. And of course, uh, between those cities has been observed that there were um, uh, paths and, and, and commerce, essentially. So commerce on the ground. Okay, So probably we're still talking about uh, walking and probably having some sort of animal, uh, like, like the donkeys, or uh, to, to, to carry. The, the goods, okay? Uh, in the case of Egypt, that you also have it uh, relatively close and nearby, they use the, the famous boats to uh, produce uh, a, so a kind of highway, okay? <laughs> in the, just using the Nile, you can go from, from the Mediterranean coast all the way down. And actually they did it uh, relatively early. So that means at least uh, 4,000 years before the present era. And uh, they did it systematically because 3,000 years before the, this time, uh, they already unified the country. So essentially, there were movements uh, from the very north uh, to the very south and the other way around. The, going from the south to the north is easy because they are just following the current of the river. Uh, going to the north implied the, the sailing or rowing, as, as you can see in those in those papers below. Uh, of course, this has happened for all the time that uh, the Egyptian civilization has been uh, in there and, and even up to today. So essentially they, they are not using, well, the sailing is kind of anecdotal today, of course, but, uh, but this is still a, a way to, to, to go through, through all that. No? Um, but essentially the, the important thing of these questions is that beyond the, the question of, uh, of political issues or cultural issues, the, this kind of transportation and the commerce that it was associated to it was moving uh, people, moving uh, goods, moving ideas, moving uh, new technologies from one place to the other. No? And uh, this implies not only Egypt, but all the way to, to the Mediterranean coast of Lebanon and of course Sumeria and, and Mesopotamia. Uh, this development was happening later more and more. And uh, in the next, uh, the next years, we had the development of uh, roads. No? So actually the, the, first, uh, the first example of a road that I ma managed to, to find was uh, the Persian 
uh, I think it's, I know the name in, in Spanish, but not in, <laughs> I think it's something like the Royal, the Royal Road or something like that, that was crossing the Persian Empire from one side to the other. Okay, that was later followed by the Macedonians when they invited uh, the, the Persian Empire. And um, it was an example where there was a, a main, clear, clear main road, no? uh, crossing a huge territorial space uh, and reaching also again to, to the Middle East and to your country. Because uh, in the case of uh, the Mac 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 Macedonian conquest, uh, actually, uh, Lebanon also played an important, an important role. No? Uh, after that, uh, the Romans essentially uh, realized that that was a good idea. <laughs> so they started to do it systematically and they produced, uh, uh, starting from Rome, uh, this, the, 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 the main roads of the, of the time. Uh, I don't know if, because in Spanish they have a different name from road. Uh, so, but I don't know if in English is also the case. No? Uh, well, this, these Roman roads, let's say, uh, <laughs> that they started in Rome and they started to spread, to spread as the, the empire was uh, expanding. And uh, they facilitated again the movement. In this case, it was ground movement. You know? So you could have chariots with animals or just walking, uh, those things. And it was developed mostly at the very beginning for mobility of, uh, of the troops, of, of the legions, and uh, of the goods that the legions were needing. Okay? But after that, uh, of course, they created a, a very dense commercial uh, network. And uh, this is the, an example of how it looked like. Um, and it was, as you see, going from Rome to almost everywhere in Europe, uh, Northern Africa, and, and, and the Middle East. Uh, they joined uh, big capitals, big cities, let's say. No? So it's, it's curious to see that uh, this is quite similar to what we have still today. Uh, this is the, the trans-European roads. Uh, that are the ones that are uh, associated to, uh, to longer travels across countries. No? And as you can see, when you compare the two uh, structures, the things are not so different, actually. So they were following more or less the same paths because of convenience, of course, it was, it was the, the, the question. No? Um, this was a little the kind of introductory thing, of course, the, the the transportation, ah, well, no, this, this was something else. So uh, the transportation has evolved after that. Okay? So the, the roads were the first step. Then, of course, we have to wait until the 1800s to see the trains. And after the trains, uh, or almost in parallel to the trains, also the metros in, in big cities like, uh, like London, Paris, and then later in, in, other, in other ones, uh, until almost a generalization of the mobility by, by by train or metro, actually, in the, in the big cities. Uh, in the middle was also the, the trams, and um, almost until today. No? So today we are also suffering a revolution in the mobility in the mobility side that has to do with the new technologies of, of mobility. That is, I mean, most, mostly they are uh, electric, and uh, they tend to be personal in the sense that uh, they are start to be like what is called personal mobility solutions, which um, means uh, small devices that allow you to, to move uh, more or less freely in the, in the cities. No? Um, okay, but uh, on that, uh, we will go later. Uh, one of the important things of this question of mobility is that I was telling you uh, it was helping to uh, uh, move uh, people, but also ideas and other questions. No? And uh, one of these questions is, is uh, epidemics. Epidemics was moving, uh, I mean, let's say the virus or the bacteria were using us as uh, vehicles. And they were moving as people was moving. So essentially, an example is this one. This is the the black uh, the black black plague. Uh, okay, that started uh, well. It started in the steppe somewhere in, in the area uh, of Siberia, uh, but later was uh, when it, it reached to the European uh, and Middle East areas. Essentially, it started uh, in in the area of Crimea. There was a, a siege of a city there. And um, the, the attackers start to die of, of the Black Plague, um, at least doc the first documented uh, example. And after that, um, the, the, the city fell and some refugees uh, flew to, to Constantinople. And as you can see in red is the year uh, 1347, where the disease has arrived. Okay, so it went by boat all the way here, still red. Uh, and then uh, also it reached the, the Mediterranean, essentially the, the main Mediterranean harbors 
of uh, uh, Europe uh, and, and Africa. I think uh, also Cyprus, Cyprus, but not, uh, not yet the, the coast. And after that, it started to enter. Okay, so uh, enter into the into the continental uh, areas. So essentially, from the red, you have the the blue. From the blue, the yellow. And uh, in a few years, it managed to to do the whole trip. So essentially, from here, all the way up uh, to the north and coming back to the to the steppes. Uh, this was reflecting the, the transportation of this time. Okay, so uh, what you are seeing there is how time by time these things have been moving. Uh, little by little. Uh, if you consider more, more recent examples, like uh, the Spanish flu of, of uh, 1920, uh, 1918, uh, in this case, the, the thing was a little different because already transportation of the time was different. So essentially the first cases um, were documented uh, much later, yeah? because at the time it was not documented, uh, this question. Uh, were documented in, in the area of Texas, in the US, and uh, due to the First World War, uh, the troops were being uh, shipped to, to Europe. And actually, the, the first influenza cases arrived in France uh, with the troops. And then in, it started to propagate in the, over the land. And from, uh, I mean, apart from the European scenario where, uh, well, actually, there was the war. So essentially, there were many other things happening at the same time. So it was not reported until it didn't reach a, a neutral country that was, in this case, Spain, that was not involved in the war. Uh, but uh, from there, also with the boats, uh, it arrived Africa uh, and, and Asia, uh, following more or less the, the, let's say, the main trade networks of the time that was related to the uh, two big empires that, that were in force on, on that moment, it was uh, the UK and the British Empire, let's say, and, and France, okay? So essentially the, the connections from, from Europe to, to the other countries were following this kind of commercial trades. Uh, and of course, we have the last example of what has happened with COVID. In this case, the things were more complicated because uh, uh, the difference between the 18, 1918 today is that uh, the air transportation network has developed and uh, now it's very easy to, to reach one place to or another of the planet in, in less than a day you know, or in a day and a half in, in maximum. So essentially, uh, supposedly started in, in China in the fall of 19. And as you know, this happened in Wuhan. Wuhan is over here. Uh, and Wuhan is the fifth largest city of, the, of China and is connected uh, to almost everyone. So essentially there were direct flights and, and it jumped from there. Uh, to different countries, uh, the US and Europe, I think, at the very beginning, and then later uh, it started to move to other, uh, other areas, no? like, for instance, South America, that traditionally, even for the influenza, is, uh, is, is arrived later. So it's, uh, it's affected usually even one year later than the, other rest, than the rest of the world, because the communication is, uh, is uh, kind of half like intermediate steps. And also in, in the South, the summer and the winter are interchanged with respect to the to the north. Yeah? So um, in influenza, at least that, that is a seasonal uh, disease, it is known that actually uh, you have first the outbreaks in the north and then the outbreaks in the, in the south. Okay, so this this is, uh, as I was telling you, this is reflecting the, transport, the transportation networks. Uh, so it's, it's a reflection of, of the mobility by itself and uh, the mobility is, uh, it appears now everywhere because uh, the world is today highly, highly connected. Uh, what happens is that there are mobility at different scales. So we have mobility, as we were saying here, at the worldwide scale. And this is mostly uh, transportation or uh, there are also the, the, the cargo ships that are also moving uh, goods from one side of the world to the other. Uh, but this is essentially the, the main mechanism in that, in that scale. Uh, what we wanted to discuss today was mostly about mobility inside cities. Okay, so cities is, are uh, are different uh, environment because, of course, the distances are much smaller. So you are not going to use a plane uh, to move uh, inside the city. Well, I mean, there are cases where there has been used <laughs> a plane. No, especially in the in the areas like uh, Los Angeles, uh, sometimes they use air transportation also to avoid the, the traffic jams. Uh, but normally, no. Normally, you just planes to, to move inside the city. So essentially, this, this is the number of, of transportation media that you have at your disposal. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the, the combination of transportation media is, is different. 
Uh, about bi the bibliography of, of these topics, uh, there are a few books um, that are interesting, that this, this, uh, this one by Alan Wilson or this one by Michael Batty. Michael Batty has another, I think, another one much more recent that is from 2017, 2018. So that those are nice uh, books to, as introduction to uh, what is called city science. Okay, so this is the, in this book, actually, Michael Batty proposed the name of science of cities or city science, okay? Uh, then there is this, this uh, reviewer here that actually is, uh, is something that we did uh, in 2018 that it more or less covers uh, many scales of mobility and many of the aspects of, of uh, modern mobility. And then uh, the, the papers I'm going to show you today are uh, these four over here, okay? So uh, this one that was the first, uh, first study on how is the mobility in cities regarding the areas of concentration. Uh, this one that, uh, that covers the, the question of how the different um, high mobility areas are connected between themselves. Uh, this one is a later development of that, actually, where we talk about the possible hierarchy of, or, or hierarchies of these centers of activity. And finally, the last one is the one that uh, has to do with the impact of COVID in, oh, well, the other way around, actually, the impact of the mobility organization on COVID spread. Okay. Um, okay, so this, these are the books. And uh, why we wanted to study uh, cities? Well, there are several questions. Yeah, I mean, there are some questions that are like uh, more localized, more uh, political or political, no, policy development uh, tools that are trying to, let's say, to decide, for instance, uh, how to make a new uh, bus line or how to make a, a new train uh, metro line or whatever. It, this, this is done with more realistic models. What I'm going to show you here is, is a question that has to do with the organization of the cities at a medium level. Okay, so we are not talking about micro level, which is the mobility of every single person and which is the transportation media that you use and so on. We also have worked on that, uh, but this is closer to uh, engineering uh, questions. Uh, what we wanted to do with this work was to, to tackle an, an issue that appeared in urbanism uh, in 2004 and actually has been in geography also somehow uh, there for many, many years, actually. I think that the first ones, the first ideas on what is called central, uh, central place uh, uh, theory is from 19, beginning of the 90s, okay? Uh, and well, the idea of, of uh, this was uh, uh, this question of what is called the centers of policy centers of the cities was uh, uh, well expressed by, by Berto in 2004. Then he was saying, okay, the typical uh, idea of what a city is uh, in this context is something like what you have in this, uh, in this plot over here on the, on the left, okay? So there is a central business district that is the area where you have uh, all the, the companies and, and the working places of the, of the city. And then the, the people is living in the suburbs, okay? So uh, they move every day from the home areas to the working areas and then come back, okay? So uh, this is the, what could be called monocentric city. There is only a single activity center and then everybody's moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So essentially you have a city that uh, in practice is beating like a heart, okay? Um, then uh, another option would be to have um, a city uh, like what you have on the right that is, is polycentric. So essentially you have uh, different activity centers and uh, well, I mean, it could happen that each of them has a certain basin, basin of attraction where people live in these areas and go to work in, in these activity, uh, activity centers and go back, okay? There can be also some kind of relation between these centers uh, that at the beginning was not very clear. Our, our work is about the relation between these, these different centers, okay? And then of course you can have a completely random city, which is that everybody connects uh, like crazy and then make no sense also. This is a string case and also, uh, a case where it's a mix between monocentric and, and uh, kind of random. Uh, in practice, the, the question is that probably cities are uh, between the one on the right, on the top right here, and the one on the top left. Okay, so there is the question of uh, where they are in this kind of, of a spectrum, and what we can say about uh, the, the other characteristics that the city have based on the type of mobility that they have developed. 
Okay, so um, this is a little idea. And for this, we need the uh, data because uh, Bertot was uh, just uh, hypothesizing here how should be the organization of cities, but there was no data on that time uh, to really be able to see what uh, was happening. No? So actually the first, uh, the first works on, on the use of what is called non-conventional data for measuring these kind of questions started in 2005, 2006, and, and a little later. No? Um, okay, so the data that you need for this is uh, data that has to do, um, I mean, because before that, the, the, the usual thing was done with service. And with service, you can get some of these uh, reflections, but it's, uh, it's not so easy to, to get that information. So the, the data that uh, you can use for this is mostly data based on, on the new technology. So essentially mobile phones, um, social networks that are giving you a, a geolocation uh, and a clear time where people has been in different places. And then you can really uh, estimate almost in real time, which is the flows of mobility of how many people is going from one place to another place. Um, and this this will give you the reflection of these uh, mobility patterns that you're seeing about cities. Okay, in this first work, this is the one from 2014 that I was telling you. Uh, what we have was um, an agreement with a company, uh, a, co a telephone company, okay, that uh, cover uh, most of Spain. And actually, this is a, a multinational, so essentially they also have data in, in in other countries. But in the case of Spain, this was the majority company because. Uh, at that time, they they were already privatized, but they used to be the public, the public one, and the only one for quite a while, actually. Okay, so in this case, what we do is just uh, we select what is called the uh, functional urban areas, so essentially the areas, the cities, and the areas around them that uh, are considered like part of the of of the metropolitan areas, and uh, you have in here the thirty something thirty one largest uh, cities in, in Spain, okay? And uh, for each of them, what we have is the, the data of mobile phone records. So essentially every time that someone was making a call or receiving a call, uh, we have location of the of, of the tower that is giving service to, to that person. And uh, what we introduced were uh, flows between uh, aggregations of towers. So essentially how many people that has been seen in a certain area has appeared in another, in another area, okay? Um, well, first we did some checks on the on the demographics, so just in case, because of course uh, uh, with mobile phone records, what you are going to obtain is a fraction of the total population. Okay, it's not the total uh, population, and you know that you have to multiply by a certain factor to reach the, the total. So, and what you have in here, for instance, is the area versus the population of of all the cities from Madrid, Barcelona, uh, Zaragoza, and so on. And in here on the on the right, what you have is the average density uh, as it is in the in the census. These are the the full cycles, and the the crosses are representing uh, what we are finding with the mobile phones. Okay, uh, with are deviations like in here, is something that needs to to be corrected. Uh, this comes, for instance, in the case of in this case, I think it was uh, in Barcelona it seems to work. Uh, okay. But in Madrid, the question is that uh, the fraction of the population that is using that company uh, are, um, I think it was more than in Barcelona. So essentially, this is why we got a higher value. No? So, but that, that essentially means that you have to correct city by city to get uh, uh, some points that are close to the, to the points that you have from the census, okay? Uh, so after doing that, uh, you can more or less trust a little the, the data. The data, as I was telling you, comes in, in this, this, uh, this thing. This is, this is the sea, this is Barcelona, okay? And uh, what you see here are uh, the Boronoi tessellation of the space according to the towers. The towers are in the center of these uh, small polygons, okay? And um, what happens is that, uh, what you assume is that they provide service to the closest area to every tower. So if you consider that, what you get is this sort of strange uh, uh, polygons. The area that is more, more dense, in, most dense in, in this well, densest area is actually the one that has the center of the city because the, the companies uh, introduce more and more towers where they know that they have more and more clients and they have to give more service. No? So essentially the center of, of Barcelona is, is over here it's in, the, in, this, in this area. Uh, and at this level is where you have the flows. So how many people that appear in one of these uh, polygons is in the other uh, certain time later, okay? 
Uh, we pass it to, to the squares. Uh, in some cases, it was easy because it was, it was just aggregating. And in other, we have to, to split part of the, the info. Uh, this is because actually it was easier to, to handle uh, equal area uh, spaces and not to have to, to consider the heterogeneity. Because as you see here in some areas, you have huge spaces, while in other, you have very small ones. You know? so, uh, it was easier to get this one, uh, even though, of course, the ones that are in the same big area have the same signal. Eh? So you just distribute the information equally, which is not correct, strictly correct, let's say, but is what you have in, in this scale. Okay, so with that, uh, we can see the, the signals. The signals that you, you obtain when you use this, uh, this kind of things are uh, number of users, usually uh, per area, and also uh, in the as a function of time. No? So this is a typical day. I think it was working. Ah, no, these are the, the, the days. OK, so every curve is a day. OK, uh, uh, and then what you see is that actually the number of uses that we are seeing depends on the number of calls that they were doing or receiving. OK, so essentially it's a little on the activity that they take on the phones. Uh, there are, in most of the places, what you find is this uh, two-peak structure that is uh, quite characteristic in in, I think, at least in Spain and I think also in Italy, uh, but probably also in, in other countries of the South, let's say. No? So if we go to North Africa or, or, or to the area of the Middle East, probably it's also the same. So people stop for, la for lunch at the middle of the day, okay? Um, so if there was no stop, essentially you would have the single peak uh, and, and that was it. And uh, well, I mean, interesting thing of this is that actually the the height of the peaks telling you something about the number of uses that you see, so essentially the activity that you have there, and the depth of the of the stop is also telling you some characteristics about how when people stops. No, um, not only when or this would be how many people stops, but also the time more or less that that this happens. This is interesting because Spain is is not very big as a country, but at least you have almost a one time zone. Uh, I mean, officially, no, eh? I mean, we have all the, time, the same time zone, but uh, there is almost 1,000 kilometers to, from one, uh, from the very east to the very west. So essentially, you have also an influence of the sun, even though we have the same uh, official hour. And uh, this implies that sometimes you see that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, the, the, the valley over there is displaced depending on, on the latitude and especially longitude of those, uh, of those cities. Okay, so this is a, this was anecdotal uh, somehow, but uh, uh, we could, the interesting thing is that this is uh, the area of Madrid, okay? Is that we could see uh, how this activity was uh, changing in time. And you can see that, that the cities uh, more or less uh, like switching uh, on and off. Uh, in red, you have, uh, this is a heat map. So essentially in red, you have the areas that have a highest concentration of, of people, okay? Uh, this is the, in the case of Madrid, this, this area that is here in the, in the middle is the, the center of the city. Okay, it's a very long, uh, very long gated center. It's, it's along a huge avenue. And then um, there was interesting also that there are some other, uh, other places like these ones, or even this one over here that is much bigger, that uh, switch on and off in, in red color very strongly, and this one over here, um, but only for a moment. Okay, so this would be centers that, uh, that are only temporary. This means essentially in the case of Madrid, this, uh, this area on the, here on the south is uh, what is called Merca Madrid. So it's the, the area of logistics for the, for the full city. So essentially the goods arrive there very early in the morning and then they are distributed in the, in the, in the full city, okay? So, um, but these are somehow what we are talking about centers of activity. These, these are the centers, okay? So this is a photo of what we want to study directly. Um, we started with a kind of uh, approach that it was kind of, well, let's, let's not measure directly the centers. We will do it later, okay? But in the first approach, what we did was just to say, okay, in mind that we, we define this metric, this one is uh, in every cell, how many people, this S refers to the number of people that is in a, in a cell, okay? So essentially what we are doing is multiplying the number of people in a cell by the number of people of another cell and by the distance between them, okay? So if two very active cities, uh, two, two very active cells, sorry, are very far apart, then the value will be high. If uh, the very active cells are all together, uh, the distance will be small and this value will be, will be small, 
okay? And this one over here is just a normalization factor. So this, uh, this big D is something that uh, will tell you how far apart is the, the activity centers in the, in the city. And uh, it may happen that actually, in, remember the, the monocentric idea of the city. So as I said, you have a city that everybody's living in the suburbs, going to the center, uh, going to the suburbs, going to the center. So if this happens, this D, uh, when they are uh, in the suburbs for sleeping, then there will be a, a big number. And when they are in the center working, it will be a small number. So essentially, the fluctuation that you have in time will have a maximum and a minimum, okay? And if you measure the difference of D in between the maximum and the minimum, what you will be observing is a sort of dilation of the city mobility, okay? So these are the examples of the cities like that. This is the D in time. And what you see is that in Madrid, uh, you have a maximum and a minimum that are the too high, but relatively close and very nearby. Seville is a kind of middle case. And then Zaragoza is a, a city of 1 million people, more or less, uh, is the string case on the other string. Okay, so essentially what you have is the, the maximum and the minimum very, very clearly separated. Okay, and then when you put this, this dilation factor uh, as a function of the, of the cities, uh, I think they are ordered, no, they are ordered by, by mu. Okay, so from bigger to smaller. Actually, the smaller is Madrid, the smallest value. And uh, the second, I mean, Barcelona is this one because the size of the of the circles respond to the to the population. Okay, so Barcelona is the second largest uh, population uh, city in in Spain, and um, they are all characterized by uh, small values of mu. So as I say, that means that people is not uh, fluctuating. The population is not fluctuating so much. Okay, in those big cities, in there are some intermediate cases. And then there are this, what we could call segregated cities uh, that includes uh, Zaragoza, I think, is one of these points. Okay, so it's what we are seeing as a city that is really uh, beating like a, like a heart, if you want. So this is one almost a, an example of sort of monocentric city. Okay, um, this was with this kind of parameter just to characterize a little the, the phenomenon. But uh, then the question is that, as I was telling you, we were having the photo of what we want to study. So we were seeing um, the activity centers in the, in the previous video. And uh, the only thing that you needed then is to, to establish a threshold to decide, OK, this is a high activity center or this is not a high activity center. So uh, we developed a method uh, in that uh, in this work that was to try to establish the, the threshold in a natural way. So essentially, we use the distribution of, uh, of activity uh, to generate a, a Lorentz curve, which is as the fraction of, in case you have the fraction, I mean, you order the, the cells uh, by activity from the smallest to the highest, okay? And then what you do is to represent the fraction of cells on the x-axis and the fraction of activity, of total activity up to that point in, in the, in the y-axis. If the, every cell has the same activity as the other, this goes in the diagonal, if not, the curve deviates from the diagonal, the more it deviates, the more unequal is your distribution, okay? And actually this, this kind of curve, this Lorentz curve, are used to calculate the Gini index in economics, okay? So uh, Gini index uh, uh, high means, uh, the Gini index is the area between these two, uh, two things, so between the diagonal and the blue curve. And uh, the, 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 the higher it is, the, the more in, unequal is your, your society, okay? In this case, what we did was to cut uh, the, the Lorentz curve at one one, uh, and then uh, do the, the tangent over here. And well, this, this was a kind of natural uh, threshold for, for deciding oh, over here, these are high activity centers, okay? If you do that, uh, you realize that actually the number of activity centers, this is the question of the scaling, goes with the population of the city uh, almost like one half. Okay, uh, this is quite natural because actually this means that uh, we are, I mean, think that the cities are in, uh, in on a space. So essentially they are a two dimensional objects somehow and uh, the population is distributed all over the place. So essentially uh, not homogeneously, eh, but they are distributed all over the place. So essentially that means that uh, the important scale if you have here one half is not the population, it's the distance that the people has to move, okay? Uh, and well, the number of centers are, is related mm, directly to the distance in the city, okay? So if the distance starts to grow too much, then you, a, new, a new center is, is, is activated. 
Okay, and then the people start to uh, to distribute between the, the different centers. Uh, this is what was telling us this uh, this uh, this plot, and actually there was later a work, a theoretical work, to, to discuss all these all these questions. And and yes, I mean actually the, the easy solution was to consider the distance as the main variable uh, in the activation of new uh, of new centers of activity. Okay, uh, well we check uh, that everything was consistent for different scales and so on. And then we also study a little the, the duration of the centers. No? So because some centers were uh, static, they were all the time there, and some others were activating and deactivating, as I was showing you at the beginning. Um, okay, so this, this was the first work. And actually what we did here was to see, yeah, there are centers, the centers scale with the population a certain way. And, uh, and well, uh, there was a lot of questions yet left about uh, how the centers relates, which are the, the connectivity between them and so on. So it, this is something that we did in yet another work. Luckily for that time, we we managed to collaborate with people from, from Google and they could give us uh, data, uh, not only for Spain, but for many other countries in the world. No? Uh, actually the coverage is what you see in, in here on the left in the, in the map. And uh, what we did, uh, because the coverage was relatively good in terms of, of countries, not so good about the rural areas. Yeah? Okay, so there were some tricks there because um, uh, some thresholds have been imposed to actually uh, ensure the, the privacy of, of people. So essentially, uh, we didn't have all the data complete. Uh, while these thresholds for the flows, so for the number of people that is traveling from one area to the other in the urban regions is not important because actually there are more, more people than the threshold and you get almost the full numbers. In the rural areas, you are losing part of the part of the information, okay? The, the, the cells in this case were not squares because uh, the, the people from Google usually use the, what they call S2 cells, which are some sort of hexagons, uh, okay? In some cities are also are, are squares, but not in all, okay? Um, and so this, we use this, uh, this data. And then, I mean, here what you have is the uh, a zoom for the US and then a zoom for the New York area, okay? And this is essentially the, let's say the, 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 the data that we were using for the analysis. What we did, okay, what we wanted to do in this, in this analysis was not only to see where there are centers, but how the centers relate between themselves. And for that, we have to classify the areas, not only you are a high activity center or not, as we did in the, in the previous work, but we needed to repeat it in a sort of systematic way. So what we did is, remember, this is what we did in the previous way. And if you are on top of this, you are high, very high, activity area okay but then you you can take this um, these uh, cells out of the out of the Lorentz curve and then uh, generate a new curve the new curve will go a little more to the towards the diagonal okay because you have taken the top uh, the top the, the top cells in the in the jerk uh, and then when you do that uh, you can repeat the the fit to the new curve and to the new one and to the new one and so on okay so until all the cells have been classified Okay, so if you do that, um, and then you, you plot the different cities in the world, this is what you, you find. Uh, in, in here you have on, on the color are the red ones are the, the level one. So essentially the top hotspots, what we call um, activity hotspots in the, in the previous work, okay? And then uh, in orange, you have level two, uh, yellow level three, level four here. And then the blue are the level five and, and plus. So they are together, okay? There are, in most of the big cities, there are uh, up to 10 levels or 11 levels sometimes, okay? And then what happens? Well, you can see it here. So essentially in, in the top line, you have uh, cities that are around uh, 10, 12 million people, okay? And below uh, you have the ones that are around uh, five, six million people. Um, in Paris, uh, let's, let's take the ones on the top, okay? Because they are easy to, to follow. Uh, in Paris, what you have is that the red areas, the, 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 the hot top stop, uh, the hot stop, uh, hot spots of mobility, are concentrated in a in a very clear area of the city, okay? And then you have like a, a shells over them that are uh, spreading farther and farther in the in the con well, until you reach in the countryside, you say, no? Uh, but this is kind of concentric, so this is interesting because somehow reminds a little of this question of the monocentric city. It's not that actually Paris has no, no other activity centers. I mean, you can see that there are some other over here, but even so the structure is relatively concentric. Okay. When you move to Bangkok, the things start to get a little less, less compact. 
and uh, appear some other centers uh, in other areas of the, of the city. And when you go to Los Angeles, you can really see what is a non monocentric city. Okay, so this one has a, an activity center over here, which is where is downtown, where is Hollywood and all that area. But then you also have many other red spots all over the place. Okay, so these are uh, top mobility centers that are spread all over the city. Okay, so this, this was the first thing that you see that actually you, you have this kind of classification of cities from a structure monocentric and somehow to very, very spread out, okay, in, in, the, in the activity centers. Um, okay, this gives us the idea of, of studying what we call the hierarchy between the activity centers. Uh, this, this was inspired by what happens with the human organizations. So in the human organizations, we are supposed to be a hierarchy. It could be a company, it could be a, in the army. And then the top guy uh, that is uh, the president of the company usually talks to the VPs, to the vice presidents over there. And then uh, if he wants something, he asks this to, to one of the vice presidents, the vice presidents asks to the, the one below, no? and, and so on, until uh, someone, the information gets down, 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 down. Someone does it, and then the information comes back up. This is um, the idea of a hierarchical structure. Okay, uh, what happens with the question of the city and the mobility flows? Okay, well, we have the cells that are the areas of the cities organized from uh, in levels. No? So we know that some of them are very important for mobility, some of them intermediate, and some of them not so much. Uh, which would be the equivalent of this idea of hierarchy? Well, the equivalent would be that uh, someone that is on the top, for instance, this one one. Okay, so this is the, the first level, and uh, interact only with the ones of the same level. In, in this case, interact means uh, the flow of mobility happens between those two, okay? Uh, so if, if, uh, it's a strict, if it is about hierarchy, this means that the top with the same level or the top with the second level, like it happens here, okay? Uh, so the idea is that if the city is hierarchical in mobility, what should happen is that uh, if you make this, uh, this matrix with the total flow of trips between areas of level one, areas of level two, areas of level three, uh, will be concentrated in this orange area, which means that uh, the, the, the high level or the level, <laughs> the, the cells of a certain level uh, have trips between themselves or between them and one level up, one level down, okay? This will be a factor in the city will be hierarchical, I should say. Um, so we, we also introduced a metric for this, which is essentially how, uh, which fraction of the trips are concentrated in the orange area with respect to the total, okay? And uh, this will tell you if actually the city is structured in a hierarchical way or, or not. Okay, so if you apply that to the, to the previous uh, maps that we saw, like this one's over down here, what you find is that actually uh, what are hierarchical are these cities over here, okay? So these are the ones that have high values of field. Well, the ones that are over there, uh, so like uh, Los Angeles, uh, what they are is on this side, okay? So these are non hierarchical cities. You have many centers of activity, very separated, and the mobility happens between the, the cells of the different level. They are not organized in, in such a hierarchical structure, okay? Interestingly, also, this, this is related also to, to the geography, okay? So in, in Europe and Asia, you usually have uh, more uh, hierarchical cities, okay? So this means that somehow the cities were developed in a moment that uh, probably mobility was not so easy. Like for instance, if we think about uh, the ones in the cities of the Middle East or, or the ones here in, in Europe, they were pro probably developed in the time that uh, walking or going by, by horse was the only option. So essentially the travel could not be very long and then the population should, compact, should get compact and um, all the activities or all the services should be concentralized somehow. No? So uh, this is what we see in, in Asia and, and Europe. While in the Americas, that some of these cities and in Oceania uh, have been developed when the car was already available in a massive way, are much more wet, wet spread, okay? So uh, this is essentially what is telling us this, uh, this kind of plot, so that you have this kind of continuum between one type of cities and another type of cities. Okay, so this, this would be kind of anecdotal, so somehow, well, I mean, it's interesting for the geographers, I guess, <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, it was not when the story finished. Actually, there, there has been um, a lot of uh, work uh, in geography trying to, to uh, find the connection between different parameters of the cities, uh, 
that usually are related to all sorts of things from education level to uh, wealth in and income to many other questions uh, towards uh, main variables that are representing the quality of life of cities, okay? And um, they have even created something that is called the, the sprawl index, which is uh, some of these uh, indices that actually one of these scores that capture 22 of these variables that I was telling you uh, and give you a connection with uh, variables based on health or based on, uh, on pollution and air quality and things like that. So we said, okay, well, why don't we try to use this mobility hierarchy as the main variable, not, not to use these 22 variables of, of uh, all sorts of types of, uh, of uh, information. And let's see what happens. No? So let's see if actually the hierarchy of the city is already informative on uh, the quality of life or the livability of, of the different cities. For that, we need um, a source of, of information for the indicators of this quality of life. Okay, so, and then um, we started by the US because uh, in there, uh, all this uh, in, uh, information and these indicators are, are collected in a uniform way. Okay, so uh, the, the statistical office in there essentially imposes some kind of criterion of how to measure them. And this is easier uh, than to have everything uh, spread. And then when we do that, uh, we have started to start this, that uh, first, um, the transportation, so like for instance, public transportation model share is uh, much higher in central, in, in cities that are hierarchical, like New York is the most hierarchical city in the, in the US. Okay, and this is a, a cause and an effect actually, okay? So uh, you have a better uh, urban uh, transportation system uh, Usually it is developed in a kind of a centralized way. And so it's favoring, it's favoring the, the hierarchy of the, of the city. Then uh, this is also linked to the fact that, of course, these cities have less emissions per capita, okay? Uh, in this case, NOx emissions, which is a, a type of emission that is li uh, linked to, to transportation, to, to cars and, and buses and, and trucks, okay? And then finally, we try to do the last jump to, to help. And then we did this, this plot. Uh, this plot is the ischemic hair stroke, uh, death rate, okay, uh, versus fee. And we found this and we we're very happy saying, okay, wow, the, the ischemic heart stroke is a type of heart stroke that uh, according to, to the medicine literature is, uh, is uh, very connected to uh, the pollution in the, in the city. No? But this was very strange because actually the, the pollution is, uh, I mean, it's connected to the concentration of the pollution, not to the pollution. Okay, so in, you may have a city that is emitting huge amounts of, of pollutants, but if there is a strong winds or the, 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 the dominant winds in the city is, is uh, getting the, the pollutants out of, the, out of the city, the concentration is low. So that, 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 is, that was strange, so how? So we, we plot, reported this with the, uh, not with the death rate, but with the number of cases. And actually we didn't, found this, uh, we didn't find this, uh, this relation. The relation was coming from the death. Okay, uh, and it is important because actually uh, this kind of disease, it's, uh, it's a stroke. So essentially you, you are affected and then you need uh, immediate help you want to survive. Okay, and what we found is actually that the relation uh, was holding for the distance to the closest hospital. Okay, so if uh, you are in a, in a geological city, the services are uh, more concentrated, but also the population is more concentrated. So most of the times you are closer to a hospital. And that means that you are getting help uh, faster than in, uh, in non-geographical cities, okay? And uh, we can found the same, we found actually the same signal for uh, uh, traffic accidents uh, when you also need help relatively fast and, uh, and the, mortality, the mortality of traffic accidents is higher in uh, non-centralized cities, okay? So this, this was a kind of, um, the, let's say, the relation between, between the three topics, so uh, mobility, uh, uh, pollution and, and health. And then the, we check this in, in other cities uh, outside of the US uh, where we could find the information eh? because uh, getting information in a more or less homogeneous way outside, uh, outside the single country is a little tricky. Uh, but well, we, we found information in, in, I think it was the UNESCO data set or something like that. Uh, and then we saw that actually the, the, the three uh, questions that I was telling you is more or less standing all over the place, not only in, in, the, in the US, okay? 
So this was the second, the second work that I wanted to, to show you. Well, we also check uh, multivariate analysis and so on, and we saw that, uh, that uh, hierarchical, the hierarchy of the mobility was actually one of the strongest indicators to explain what we were seeing. Okay, much better even sometimes than, than variables that you would expect to be more, more directly uh, connected to, to these questions. Um, okay, and then let's just uh, finish with the question of infectious diseases. Uh, well, after that, we are quite happy. And then when some urbanist was asking, you will tell, tell them, no, no, the best thing is that you do a centralized city. So don't forget about this idea of, of spreading out the, the centers of activity and that everybody is moving by car because then that's a disastrous uh, configuration. Um, and that was okay <laughs> when you are talking about, uh, let's say, the quality of life in, in, in other times, but not when you are talking about uh, infectious diseases, as you will see. No? So, well, this was an introductory question about uh, the, how infectious diseases have affected uh, also the structure of cities. Uh, because, I mean, the Black Plague, for instance, uh, was affecting uh, how the cities were built, well, Black Plagues and, and the different plagues that were happening all the way until almost our years. Uh, the cities should be structured in a way that you get a lot of ventilation and a lot of light. This was the idea uh, to avoid the, the propagation of infectious diseases um, until today, actually. So this, this, this has been like that. Uh, this is, for instance, you can see here Barcelona, and uh, you see the, the, the formation of this kind of uh, lattice uh, structure was just to allow the circulation of, of air through the big avenues and, and, the, and the big streets. And um, well, this of course happens also in the Americas. No? So in all the cities that were developed over, the, over there, the, the idea was to do this lattice to favor this, uh, this question and also to separate the, the houses enough to allow the, the light to enter, which is not the, <laughs> in, in areas very hot, like here in Mallorca or there, Lebanon probably is not a very good idea because this is also the question of the, of the heat. No? Um, but okay, it was done mostly because of this, because of the diseases. No? Um, okay, so what we did was just to create a model and, uh, and try to understand with the epidemic model what happens when you consider the two types of cities, the ones that are very hierarchical and the ones that are uh, very decentralized. No? Uh, well, I mean, these are the details that can be seen in the paper, but the idea is that you have the population and the different cells that move to the other cells, as we were saying before, okay? And uh, this is an ingredient of the, of the model. The other ingredient is the uh, infectious disease model, where some infected people can infect to the, the ones that are susceptible. And uh, well, you run this model and see how the, the disease propagates. No? What you get uh, out of these models is usually uh, the incidence curve. So essentially the number of new cases versus time. And uh, you have the famous curve with a peak that we have seen so much uh, lately. No? Um, okay, so what, what we could, uh, this, these are an example of the parameters and so on that were related to the COVID just to, to check what happens. What we found was essentially this. So, okay, so this, this early refers to uh, when you have the epidemic curve, how strong it grows at the very beginning, okay? And this is a function of phi. Uh, how we did for changing the phi? Well, we, take, uh, we took a, a real city, like in this case in the US, and uh, the real city is over here. It's on the very right side, okay? This is the, the empirical value of the mobility of the city. And then what we do is to uh, rewire the, uh, the mobility connections. So you have one area, you say, okay, this area I is connecting to an area J. Uh, then instead of area J, I'm going to select another one at random and I move it. You, you, you change this uh, certain fraction of these uh, connections. And the higher is the fraction that you change, the, lo the lower it will be fee. Because actually you will start to connect uh, hotspots of the first level with another ones of very low level. So as I said, you will produce artificially uh, a, a low, not centralized or not hierarchical city, okay? When you do that, you realize that actually um, what happens with uh, one of these diseases is that the, uh, the, how the curve starts uh, will be stronger and stronger in you are in a hierarchical city, okay? So uh, the hierarchical cities are characterized as we we're seeing by uh, an area where there is huge activity of mobility. So essentially people goes there, they mix over there, and then, of course, the, the disease grows much faster, okay? So this is the, the first result. The second result is that, uh, unfortunately, also in epidemic, this is common. So essentially, if the thing goes up very fast, it also reaches a very high peak, okay? So in here, you have the, this. This is the maximum of the, of the incidence. And what you see, it uh, as fee is higher, 
the higher it is. So essentially, you go grow fast and go very high. This means that, uh, like for instance, in New York, this was an issue in the COVID time because essentially the hospitals suffered if you have this kind of, of behavior on the curve. So, and uh, well, the, the time for the peak is, is smaller if, if it is more hierarchical, and uh, the final size is also high. Okay, so this was the um, the first finding, and then we try to introduce the lockdowns because. In the question of epidemics, we also see that there was the, the lockdowns. In the lockdowns, what we do is after a certain time, uh, when the, the incidence reaches a certain level, uh, we introduce a, a decrease in the mobility and also a decrease of, of, the, of the infectivity. Okay? So a certain fraction of the population is not playing anymore the, the game. And, um, and as happened in the, the, in the confinement uh, phase, no, where we were all at home and there was no possibility to get infected. So they should uh, stop the curve. So essentially, you introduce, um, if you don't introduce any, any uh, confinement, what you have is the normal epidemic curve, the one that we have seen all, all the time. And if you introduce confinements that are weak, the, the curve will reach a lower level and go uh, find out slower. And then uh, at a certain point, uh, if the confinement is strong enough, then it will start to decay almost instantaneously after the, after the confinement, okay? So this was in the model. And then what happens when you introduce fee? Okay, when you introduce fee, there is something very curious that may happen, okay? So, uh, so you, what you see is that the final size of the epidemic, as you were seeing before, if the confinement is not strong enough or this is zero four, okay? So this was a weak confinement. Uh, what you get is that still the, the hierarchical cities are going worse, okay? So they are, they are the ones that have the, the, the worst moment uh, for the number of people infected. This is the final size. Um, if you introduce uh, a, a little earlier, I think this PTH was the time that you were introducing the, the, the confinement. If it is a little early, you get a little better result, but still the hierarchical cities are going bad. But however, if you take the same, uh, the same time and you introduce a strong confinement, then what you see is that actually this curve goes down. Okay, so it's not going up, it's going down. The, the hierarchical cities are performing better. So they will have less people infected if you, imply, you, you apply that uh, uh, soon enough and strong enough. Okay, so this is the, the two things. This is the, the parameter space. So essentially the final size versus, versus fee for different uh, confinement uh, strengths. And as you see, there is a certain moment, uh, I think it's between 40 and 60% of the population that is staying at home. In, in the COVID cases, uh, like for instance, in, in, some, in most of European, North American cities, and I think cities in other places of the world, this was uh, the, the number of the real confinement was between 60 and 80, okay? Um, uh, but okay, so this means that we, we are in the area where actually the hierarchical cities could perform better. Okay, so uh, what this says is, uh, and this is a little the end of what I wanted to, to, to tell you, is that um, the central cities are, uh, or hierarchical cities, if you want, are better for many, many questions. No? So because first to, to maintain one of those cities, you have to have a better public transportation system, which is also good in several terms. I mean, actually, it was not only public transportation. I didn't show the... The, the plot, but uh, even uh, walk, walking in those cities is most common because things are closer. So people walk uh, more and that's also good for the health. Okay, so uh, these hierarchical cities have this advantage. Okay, so uh, they are better in, in uh, health indicators. They are less, um, let's say, less uh, or producers of less uh, pollution uh, per capita. It doesn't mean anything about the concentration, okay? That depends on the, on the geography and the wind and many other questions, but at least in the, in the number of, uh, of the tons of gases produced by, by person, they are, they are less than the, than, than the non-hierarchical cities. And uh, in many indi health indicators, chronic and, and also the, the emergency indicators are better, okay? Uh, what happens with them? Well, they have a, a bad side. The bad side is the, the question of infectious diseases. Uh, so you have more compact cities, uh, the infectious diseases propagate faster. You need to keep uh, monitor, uh, you, you need to monitor, well, the, the, the possible emergence of, of new infectious diseases like happens with COVID. But even on that, there is a good side. So essentially you are able to introduce measures fast enough and 
and uh, strong enough, uh, the, the results would be better than in non-centralized cities where the things are less controlled, okay, because the, the, the centers of activity are widespread. Okay, and um, well, I mean, this is essentially the, what we have been finding. Actually, we also have some uh, com comparison of this question of infectious disease with what happens in the US, in the American cities with the COVID. Uh, but essentially, the, the idea was the same. So essentially, this, this idea was repeated. So essentially, hierarchical cities uh, are more at risk. But if, if you apply uh, a strong con confinement, they may perform better. OK? So and well, this, this was the, essentially what I wanted to, to tell you. And I will be happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And uh, we'll start taking questions. Um, Start with the audience. None. I, I can start with questions that I have received. So, uh, Jose, you were kind of blessed with uh, access to data, uh, the mobile phone data, to get uh, all this uh, insight that you have on patterns of mobility and identification of hotspots, which we sh you showed us to be very much tied to uh, uh, optimal policy making of uh, figuring out which cities are polycentric and which cities are say monocentric uh in kind of uh, the the areas that we live in and uh, the non-availability of data data for uh such studies were there other proxies uh to uh, let's say uh, figure out hotspots let's say the structure of the network itself the transportation network if you overlay it let's say over what's happening on the mob in terms of the mobility or the si signals that you're getting from mobile Wide phones, do they somewhat match like centers uh, with like nodes with high centrality in relation to hotspots uh, that you uncover from a mobile uh, networks? Yes, yes, yes. There is uh, another way to do it. It's much more difficult somehow, no? but because you have to, to be able to categorize the, the importance of the areas. Like for instance, um, of course, uh, public transportation hubs like uh, central areas will will be one of these. But the question is that uh, you also have. Uh, one, some of these uh, activity hotspots that are related to uh, very dense resident areas, because uh, the, the hotspots can be classified also according to the, the type of use that the people is doing on those areas. No? So as you said, you may have resident areas that are very dense, you may have very strong commercial areas, and then of course you can have the, the, the transportation, the main transportation stations no? on, the, on the cities. Uh, yeah, the classification could be done without this information. Uh, we also have been checking eh, with other, other sources. And even, for instance, uh, Twitter data, in, in some cases, is enough to give you uh, an idea of where they are. Um, and Twitter is open. So essentially, this was the, the, the question. No, in the other cases, uh, the, the mobile phone companies and, and other companies like, like Google could be interested in this sort of research. Uh, but you always have to negotiate with them, because they are the owners. Um, I'm reading off questions, so um, I'm receiving stuff. So um, there's also this, let's say, order parameter that you, uh, that the phi, uh, which is a measure of hierarchy in cities. Um, and again, in the, in the sense where things are sparse, uh, I mean, the data is not available. Can one, uh, let's say, look at uh, the topology of the network, identify, let's say, a power law and relate it to phi and figure out without all this access to a mobile data, figure out what kind of cities are you at. So we're just li living in data scarce environments. So we're thinking of ways yeah, yeah, yeah. to reproduce. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be, it can be, I guess that it can be done. The, the, the question is that, uh, uh, let me show you because this is also important, just what you were saying about power laws. No? So, um, so how this, this, this method, the one of, of, of uh, that cuts the Lorentz curve, is producing a, a classification that is logarithmic. Okay, so uh, this is what is hidden somehow, but it's just a matter of the definition. So um, if if actually you you separate the distribution of of the typical let's say typical values of of these places, and then you try to see the distribution according to the levels, what you find is that actually the level one and the level two are separated by a scale. Okay, and then the third one is is an, a scale further beyond. So essentially. What you are doing here is divide the, the mobility by scales in, in, in this way. So if you have you have you can have an intuition on, on the mobility level, even if it is at the scale level. Okay, so it's uh, then you will be able to do this classification, and, and from that, 
uh, get some, some some idea on the on the hotspots and and on the type of city. Uh, it can be done even with census. We we try it also with census data. I think the only question on the census data is that the information refers to res residential uh, areas. Okay, so the the ones that are in the census area, uh, like I mean, the census in many census uh, all over the world now they are asking you where you live, where you work. Okay, so this gives you the mobility the mobility structure, but it's only the commuting mobility, uh, okay? And then on that, uh, the hotspots refer to uh, residential hotspots. So it's part of the hotspots that you will see in, in this other type of analysis, but it's not the full the full story. But probably it's, I mean, when we did, just to check that actually in, I think we, we, we did it in, in some American cities. The, the thing was, let's say fee was not exactly the same, obviously, but the ones that were high, one thing were high, you know, essentially. Okay. We have questions in the audience. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a somewhat technical question. When you linked the phone, uh, mobile phone data and the, for the population, how did you do the rescaling? What was exactly this yeah, rescaling? Yeah. And uh, I have a second question. Uh, is there a range we can know, like if we, mo if we use the mobile data, we can, uh, let's say predict the population correctly or it can be done on in general <laughs> okay I, I will start for the second one which is the <laughs> no so the, that's a, a big uh, question actually so it's still being checked how with the mobile phones you will be able to reflect or not the exact population um, it's, it's not easy it's not easy because there are many many questions many technical questions like is that the mobile phones uh, the, show, the data that I showed you at the beginning was related to the CTRs that is called call detailed records. So essentially when people make calls or receive calls, otherwise you don't see them. Okay. And then that means that uh, the data that you have is very sparse. So some, some people appear, disappear, 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 disappear. And then you have to correct for, for all that. Uh, and this is why it's still an open question, especially because the demographers usually like to say, in this area of the city, there is uh, 122 pe persons. And then you say, okay, well, <laughs> I mean, my mobile phones can tell me that there is a level corresponding to 100 persons, but I don't know if it is 122 or 130, okay? So um, uh, that's still good news. Then what we did uh, was kind of, a, uh, let's say, a hand wave approach. So what we see is, okay, in the census, we know that there are so many people in, uh, registered in the different cities. And then uh, we know that there are so many users of, of the mobile phone rec uh, telephone. And then we just uh, upscale uh, our telephone users by, by the number that gives you the total population. Okay. So the, the, the question that is that you have to do it city by city because uh, the coverage of the, of the different companies is different. So like, uh, for instance, in Spain, uh, the company that I was telling you uh, essentially uh, in Barcelona has less coverage, so less people was using that company than in Madrid. And then you cannot use a single factor for all, for all of them because you will be seeing much more people in, in Barcelona than, than in the other. Okay. I'll, I'll read off another question. Is um, uh, this model, the different city models of uh, polycentricity and monocentricity have different uh, what they call gravity model or radiation model, are they different uh, in this context um, for intercity travel? Not, not much, actually. I mean, so the, the different models, I mean, the question is that the gravity and the, and the radiation will uh, provide you the mobility out of the, of the density of population. And as I was telling you, the, um, that's not the full truth because uh, the, the density of the population, so the resident population, uh, is one thing, and the other thing in the city is where you have the, the transportation centers, the, the for instance, the, the big malls, so essentially the service centers, somehow, no? and those are not in those models. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, the gravity and, and, and the other models are good to kind of have a kind of average view of the mobility of the city, but not uh, you would not capture the, the whole story with them. Uh, they should be refined. This is the, other wor the work is still to do. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the question is, they would still uh, be valid, but uh, it's not that they're revealing anything uh, on polycentricity or monocentricity within the city. They would still work. Yes, yes. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? 
Should I keep on taking questions from the chat? Um, okay, another question uh, going back to Phi. Uh, could you do the reverse, uh, work out networks with different topology and uh, link the topology to Phi? Oh, well, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'm not sure of that because actually the, the Phi is uh, it's like you tell me, okay, I'm getting uh, the clustering. The clustering is the density of triangles in the network. Yes. Uh, so if you give me a certain clustering, reconstruct the network. Um, it could be, <laughs> but you have to at least to give some more information, no? because uh, in that case, you will need also the, the distribution of the degrees, for instance. So uh, you may say, okay, with this clustering, I can produce a family of networks, okay, that still fulfill the cluster. But it is possibly true that actually there are some other parameters that you are not uh, been able to, to pin with only that, that, that value. Uh, the hierarchy, I think, is an aggregated value for the full networks, but it's not uh, necessarily true that you can invert the, the whole thing. So, for instance, knowing where, where are the, the hotspots and uh, how they communicate, something that you will need some more information in the process. Um, good. So we have a, just a comment, I think, from the chat uh, from Aram Yeritsyan, um, just thanking you for the presentation and discussion. Um, I guess we can take, yes, if there are more, no more questions from the audience, uh, will, uh, more questions? Okay, I think no more questions from the audience and no more from the chats, at least personally. Uh, so uh, please join me in thanking Professor Jose Ramasco in uh, giving us this beautiful talk. And hopefully we'll have follow-ups on this. We've been doing this um, analysis for our uh, COVID data in Lebanon, and uh, we've reached so many conclusions that have been implemented in policy. So we'd uh, really love to, to hear what you say uh, about our assumptions in the model uh, mobility and uh, whatnot. And hopefully we'll get to have you over uh, visit campus and um, interact with people more closely. So please join me in thanking Professor uh, Ramasco. Okay, well, th thank you actually. And uh, well, it would so be great, much. yes, of course, to be there. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Have Bye. a good day. Bye-bye, see you. <laughs>